engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. To- <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, is advances, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists, the programme where we strive to bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Chris Smith. Coming up, MPs vote in favour of stricter smoking and vaping controls across the UK. But do we actually need this? And is it going to work? Also, the remains of what are thought to be the largest reptile to have roamed our seven seas get uncovered on a beach in Somerset and a tribute to the BA pilot who saved his air passengers from a volcanic ash cloud. But why are volcanoes so disastrous for jet engines? From Cambridge University's Institute of Continuing Education, this is The Naked Scientists. First this week, members of Parliament have backed a UK government proposal to ban anyone born after 2009 from buying cigarettes. The Tobacco and Vapes Bill, which passed with a huge majority, also places curbs on vaping. It effectively means that the UK's smoking laws will be among the strictest in the world. To find out more, we put in a call to Linda Bald, who's a public health specialist and a social policy advisor for the Scottish Government. The Tobacco and Vapes Bill is quite an ambitious piece of legislation and it does two things primarily. It passes into law, or it will, raising the age of sale for those born after 2009 until effectively it'd be very difficult for people to buy tobacco. I think it'll come in in 2027. That's a quite a big change from at the moment where the legal age of sale is 18. The other things the bill does are a series of measures which are primarily around vaping. The overall bill applies to all four nations of the UK, but the independent devolved assemblies or parliaments like Scottish Parliament have to endorse the legislation. But I think it's a good thing because it certainly means the main measure, raising that age of sale of tobacco, would apply across the UK. What's the evidence this is going to work, though? Rishi Sunak, when he was discussing this, used words like, we know this works. But actually, some people gave him some pushback. 57 of uh, the, the standing MPs also voted against this. They said, well, no, we don't know it works. There's no evidence. No one's ever done anything like this. The closest we ever came was, was uh, in New Zealand, where it was announced, but then a change of government saw the whole idea go up in smoke. That's correct. So in New Zealand, they were going to introduce it and it was passed into law, but then a a shift in government has meant that they, as you say, turned away from that. We don't have direct evidence of this precise measure. What we do have is evidence from a range of countries who've raised the age of sale of tobacco in the past. And let me just explain the evidence for the UK. So when we raised the age of sale last time from 16 to 18, I have to be honest that those of us in the nicotine and tobacco research community would not have chosen that as our kind of top ask for reducing smoking. But to our slight surprise, it actually made quite a big difference. So we saw a statistically significant drop in smoking in young people between 16 and 18 in the couple of years after the change came into force. We've also seen other parts of the world raise the age of sale, for example, from 16 to 18 or even to 19 in some parts of the US. And again, you see a reduction in smoking. So I think it will make a difference. But this sort of staged doing it year by year actually hasn't been done in any country. Do you think that that's maybe going a bit too far and being a bit too complicated? Because if we can get a win, as you're saying, with just a a raise in the age, do we need the complexity of saying, well, you're 14 and you can't do it, but someone who was born the year before you can? And won't it just be a bit difficult? Are most people who are going to smoke not caught up by smoking when they're in a vulnerable age, we target that age, put it beyond their reach, and then we just leave it be. Like any legislation, the proof will be in the pudding, and certainly we'll need to look at how it's implemented. And there, you know, there's a variety of things that could go wrong. I completely agree with that. But we're kind of in an interesting position in the UK where actually we have prevented a lot of smoking uptake through a range of measures, not just age of sale. So we're down to very low levels of smoking amongst young people. And what we've actually seen is in the past, it'd be very common for somebody to start smoking at 13, 14, 15. But now we're actually seeing that age of uptake is is going up a little bit. So it's not impossible that some people start even above the age of 18. 
by actually changing it gradually, I think we'll do even more for prevention. And that means that we'll be kind of stopping the remaining teenagers who are starting. And I think additionally denormalize the sale of tobacco. So I think it's an interesting policy. It's got widespread support, including from those of us in the research community who are interested, I guess, from a research perspective to see how it happens in practice. But I think we're so close to actually getting to almost no young people smoking that I think this will help as an additional measure. Indeed, because you've put your name to a letter that was published in the Daily Telegraph this week. And one of the things you write there is the majority of tobacco retailers and the public, including people who smoke, support the legislation, which will remove the blight of smoking for future generations. Do you know that the retailers want this added bureaucracy? It sounds like it will be a headache for them. And is it true that smokers actually want to see this? The advocacy organisation, ASH, did a series of surveys. So they've actually done and commissioned that polling very recently. So 69% of adults, including more than half of smokers, support the legislation and half of small retailers. And actually, it doesn't surprise me because we and my colleagues here at the University of Edinburgh produced a paper looking at small retailers in Scotland. And they found that actually small retailers were making very little profit from tobacco, and it had gone down in recent years. So I think a lot of retailers are kind of seeing this as it's not a product which is really important for them. So it's part of that denormalization. Now, the public doesn't surprise me at all, because in all my years of doing research on smoking, I have never met a a smoker, an adult smoker, who wants their children to start. And the vast majority of smokers uh, want to stop themselves, but they find it really tough. So I think Unlike a lot of other public health measures that we're debating at the moment, this one, you know, has pretty broad support. Hasn't had support from all quarters, though, including a couple of former prime ministers who have come out saying this is the nanny state and it's an overreach. Is there a danger that if we do things like this, it might turn people against what public health is trying to achieve? There's a danger that it might make people feel that they're being controlled a bit too much and there's pushback and it actually depowers other interventions. I think that's interesting. I certainly think that if you look at kind of different political colours, political persuasions, if you're a strong libertarian, um, as many of the MPs who voted against it will be, then you don't want the state to interfere too much in any anything that people have uh, in their lives. So I, I fully understand that and their fear as well is that if you do it for smoking, you know, we often hear the argument when we brought in standardized packaging for tobacco, there was a big lobby that said, oh, you know, you're going to do that for sweets or uh, soft drinks or um, donuts next, you know, will have to be have scary warning labels on them. So the sort of slippery slope argument. Tobacco is quite an unusual product. The only consumer product when use is intended is likely to kill you in the longer term. It's quite black and white. So understand where they're coming from, but I think there is pretty broad support and the, and we'll have to see how it goes when it's implemented. Linda Bald from the University of Edinburgh. A father and daughter have discovered what might be a remnant of the largest known marine reptile. Justin and Ruby Reynolds found a piece of jaw belonging to an ichthyosaur, which has been dubbed Ichthyotitan sevenensis, on a beach at Blue Anchor in Somerset. It was ultimately sent to Dean Lomax, who's a paleontologist at the University of Manchester, and he has been explaining what he's got in front of him to our colleague, Will Tingle. To go back in time a little bit, not quite to the Jurassic or the Triassic by millions of years, but uh, I received an email initially way back in May 2016 about a jawbone that was found in Somerset. And then after studying that specimen, which was found by Paul de la Salle, we described it in 2018 and we determined that it was a really unusual jawbone from a type of ancient marine reptile called an ichthyosaur. And because of the age of which this this comes from is about 202 million years old, right at the end of the Triassic, we knew then that it was something unusual and very likely came from a a really big ichthyosaur. But we were kind of hesitant as to like giving it a name or working out exactly what type of species of ichthyosaur it was. And so enter this new discovery. Justin and Ruby managed to find my scientific study from 2018, reached out and were like, hey, Dr. Lomax, we think we found another one of these giant ichthyosaur jawbones. And, And of course, you can imagine my huge grin on my face because I was like, absolutely. Yes, you have. How do you then go from these two fairly abstract samples to being able to scale it up to make assumptions or predictions about the entirety of the organism involved? 
being completely honest, with just two giant jaw bones, it is impossible to say with absolute certainty just how large our new species of ichthyosaur was. However, there are other ichthyosaurs that have been found that are on the kind of size uh, range lengthwise of between like 15 to 21 meters. The biggest one was in the region of maybe 40 to 50, maybe a little bit more percent complete. And this ichthyosaur, which has a name called Shonisaurus sicaniensis, this has an estimated skeleton length of 21 meters. Now, by comparing Paul's original 2016 discovery and Justin and Ruby's discovery with the same bone, which is called a serangula, which is a bone right at the back of the lower jaw, we can work out that the specimens, uh, Justin and Ruby's and Paul's, are about 25% larger. So by doing a little bit of kind of like quick mass and using a simple scaling factor, we can estimate that our ichthyosaur was upwards of about 26 meters. And then comparing it further with other ichthyosaurs, smaller species, and those kind of bridging the gap between the really small ones and the really big ones, we can basically work out that our ichthyosaur would have been around about the 20 to 26 meter mark, with most of the averages coming out at 25 meters. It's a very exciting finding, but I still do need some reassurances because growing up, my hero was, of course, Lypleurodon, another marine reptile, which originally thought to be 20 plus meters and in the years since has been revised down to six, which is a remarkable shrinkage. It should probably be about three feet by next year. How can you assure me that this isn't going to happen to this as well? <laughs> I kind of anticipated this question would come at some point. That makes me laugh. At the time, if I remember rightly, it was based on some really fragmentary vertebrae. And then there's been a few other kind of scalings up of Lypleurodon based on their teeth, which to be honest, teeth and vertebrae are not the best bones to try and scale up an animal on size. Because just for example, I've studied a whole bunch of different ichthyosaurs, thousands of them now over the years. And by looking at, say, some vertebrae of an individual that's 10 meters long, those vertebrae may only be, say, 12 centimeters across versus you might find another ichthyosaur that's like eight meters long. And those vertebrae may be 15 centimeters across. So vertebrae aren't ideal. That's why we have much more confidence in our scaling of that kind of 20 to 26 meter mark, because we know that we have an ichthyosaur from British Columbia that was definitely at the 21 meter range. So looking at our new specimens, uh, Paul's and Justin and Ruby's, we have something that we definitively can compare to. And we have the same bone that's, that's preserved in that animal as well. So it gives us a much, much, much more reliable estimate and scaling factor. OK, well, I'm ready to love again. But it does make you think, given that the fossil record is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what was actually alive at the time, what could be out there still ready to be discovered and something really could perhaps have the potential to knock the blue whale off its giant perch. That's quite right. And I've said for a little while, especially off the back of Paul's discovery in 2016 and our research in 2018, that we think that in time, potentially, maybe we'll have a skeleton or at least a big skull of one of these giants found. As part of our research in this new study and the 2018 study, we also looked at some bones that were found at Aust here in the UK. And these bones were originally over, you know, well, over 150 years ago. They were, again, they're very similar. They're big cylindrical chunks of bone. But back over 150 years ago, the scientists then, and even right up to this day, almost to a point about 10 years ago, people were still considering them to be the upper arm bone, say, say a humerus or upper leg bone, a femur of a terrestrial animal like a dinosaur. But in actual fact, they are also bones from the, the lower jaws or, or the jaws of, of giant ichthyosaurs. And one of them is about 30 to 40% larger than the bone from the one in Canada. So that's when you start to get to the realms of, are we dealing with something that was even maybe 30 plus meters? And then are we dealing with a thing that could take the blue whale off that very top of the largest animals ever? Maybe, maybe not. And this is the thing, as you say, this is the fossil record. And that's why it always reveals its kind of secrets and things. And this is just a little bit more of that kind of tantalizing evidence of one of these mysterious giants that lived at the very end of the Triassic period, 202 million years ago. Dean Lomax and the paper documenting that discovery has just come out in the journal PLOS One. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire, cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. Still to come, what did Captain Eric Moody tell us about how planes should handle volcanic ash clouds?
that's on the way. But first, farmers have long been wrestling with the question, how do we weed out the weeds from the crops? With 8 billion hungry mouths to feed and climate change to wrestle with, we need to make farming more efficient and a lot more sustainable. So scientists like the University of Copenhagen's Michael Palmgren have been looking at ways to cut chemical use by making crops far easier for robotic farmers to tell apart from nuisance weed seedlings that they need to remove. Agriculture is looking forward to some tough times uh, because we have more mouths on this planet that has to be fed. At the same time, climate change will maybe make lower yields. Another problem that we face are the weeds, because many weeds are very resilient. So if the predicted climate change scenarios come, then we will have maybe have weeds that are t- much more t- tougher than the crops we grow. So the weeds will take over. So how do we compete with the weeds? One solution is, of course, to use herbicides. But in a sustainable agriculture, you don't want to use any herbicides or pesticides or, 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 or as little as possible. So a solution could be to develop new resilient crops that can be detected at a very early stage mechanically, not by chemicals. So you're saying in order to make agriculture more efficient, what we should do is have plants that are easier to grow because we can get a machine to spot and tell apart weeds from plants we do want. And rather than use enormous doses of chemicals, we would just weed them out mechanically. That would be a sustainable solution. If we can find ways to detect weeds at an early stage before they grow too big and then weed them out mechanically. How would we do that then? How could we mark or earmark plants that we do want so that machines are better at telling what we do want from what we don't want? There are weeding robots now that are quite good at taking out weeds between plants And in some cases, they can also have sensors so they can detect weeds that look very different from the crops. They can move around in the fields like a lawnmower. But the problem comes when the weeds look very much like the crops that we grow, especially at a very early stage. Our proposed solution is to introduce mutations into our crops or newly developed crops that makes them distinguishable, maybe not by the naked eye, but from a robot trained by artificial intelligence that have specific sensors that can detect these subtle changes. And we have several examples for what you could do. And not by introducing new genes, just by making mutants. I presume that to make those subtle changes that would just give a crop plant a characteristic that a robot could spot easily. That's what you're advocating for, isn't it? That must be a lot easier to do than to try to engineer into a crop plant some other trait. Yes, and and a new trait can develop even from a small mutation. So, for example, leaf shape can change from a mutation. That could be one trait that you modify slightly the leaf shape at an early stage, but also color. And the color doesn't need to be something you can see with your naked eyes. It could be colour that only specific sensors can detect. And if this were to come to fruition, what sort of a difference to agricultural productivity and solving some of those things you highlighted earlier would this make? It would contribute to a more sustainable agriculture and with less use of chemicals and would open up the field for making new crops developed from wild plants but can now be used as foodstuff. It's an intriguing idea, isn't it? Michael Palmgren there from Copenhagen. And that paper has just come out in Trends in Plant Science. Tributes have been paid to the former British Airways captain, Eric Moody, who's died at the age of 82. Captain Moody saved hundreds of people from almost certain death after the plane's Rolls-Royce engines were paralysed by a cloud of volcanic ash that they flew through without realising it. I've been speaking to Rory Clarkson, who's a senior engineer at Rolls-Royce, and his job is to make sure that their engines function in challenging weather conditions. He spoke a number of times to Eric Moody across his career. The flight we're talking about was a British Airways flight from London to Melbourne, but in those days, in 82, they didn't do it direct. They would do it in legs. So the leg they were on was between Kuala Lumpur and Perth, and from Perth they'd then fly out to Melbourne. And they were totally unaware that there'd been a volcano that erupted. Uh, all they knew was that 
strange things started happening. The cabin started to fill with a smoky like dust that smelled a bit acrid. And then they started to see uh, a thing called St. Elmo's Fire, which is an electrostatic discharge on the, the, the wind, windscreen, uh, lights flickering in the night. And then they started to pick up that the engines were starting to misbehave. And within a few minutes, one engine stopped and then the other three stopped in sequence. And they were then essentially in a glide. I think Captain Moody calculated they had about 20 minutes of glide time before they would end up in the ocean or something, wasn't it? It was of that order, yeah. So they, they were at 36,000 feet, so they, they had some time to react. Eric Moody issued the famous warning to the passengers, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm your captain and we've got a bit of a problem. All four engines have stopped. We, we're doing our damnedest to get them going again. To their credit, and this is what saved the day, they didn't give up on the engines. They kept trying to restart them, and eventually they could restart them. What did Eric Moody do that meant they did get them started again? Is there a kind of protocol under these circumstances that you can resort to? And and did they do that, or did they end up resorting to other measures to try to get the plane flying properly again? There was a protocol, the appropriate one, where you lose power on all engines to follow, which is what they did which was to turn left and, and descend and try and find a, a suitable place to put the aircraft down as safe as you could. But the, as I said, the key thing was they kept trying to relight really the engines. And because of the effect that volcanic ash has on the engines, how it stops them, it meant that by the time they were getting down to about 16,000 feet, it was actually possible to restart the engines. And having restarted them, they gained enough power that they half an hour later they could get and, and land at Jakarta. Was it that at that altitude and with that change in direction, they just left the ash cloud? So they were actually feeding fresh air back into those engines again. So they had a, a better chance of getting them to restart. No, it wasn't to do with that. We need to understand why did the engine stop in the first place? And then you need to understand a bit about how a, a jet engine works. So it's a bit like a propeller aircraft, but a bit more complex in the middle. So the air comes in at the front and it has to be compressed to high pressure. It's about... 30 to 40 times the pressure of the atmosphere and then you put fuel in it and you double the temperature of the fuel of, of the gas and then you put that through what we call a turbine which is like a windmill and it, it extracts energy from that high pressure hot gas and that's used to drive the compressors at the front to keep that whole system going once you've ignited it you don't need to keep reigniting it like you would in a car petrol engine it's more like a gas hob on a gas cooker but the amount of air that you're pushing through the engine is controlled by a a key component in the, just downstream of where you're putting the fuel in and burning it. And it controls the total flow of air through the engine. And it's so hot that it would melt the volcanic ash and it would build up on those surfaces and it would start to restrict the flow through the engine. And if you lose about 10 to 20% of the flow through the engine, the whole engine stops working. And that's what happened. That the, They were in the ash sufficiently long, about four minutes, that they built up enough ash on that critical flow area so, to stop it working. Now, they didn't completely block the flow area. They just reduced it by that amount so that 36,000 feet, the engine wouldn't work. And by the time they got down to 16,000 feet, 13,000 feet kind of range, they could get enough air through the engine because the air is thicker air at those altitudes compared to 36,000 feet. They could get the, the Bunsen burner flame lit and stabilized and pull away the power. So that's what saved the day. Those engines were Rolls-Royce engines that were on that plane that day so you i don't know if you actually worked on them or one similar but when something like this happens do you get to then take them to pieces to work out what had happened and then use that as a learning opportunity fortunately we've not had the industry has not had an incident like that really since the 1990s but what was great was in the 80s and 90s when these incidents happened, they did return the engines to the, the overhaul shops and they stripped them right down to the part level, component level. And they took a lot of photographs and they wrote up what they found in reports. So I had access to those reports. And although they, at the time they didn't fully understand the evidence that they were looking at, fortunately, with the advances in science we've had since then, I was able to piece together what had happened in details and relate that to modern engines, the engines that are powering aircraft today we've demonstrated the level of volcanic ash exposure they can tolerate and in which it's safe to fly and you also spoke to eric moody himself a couple of times was was he the cool customer that he's conveyed as being uh, he, he joked when they got off that plane when he, he landed it the engineer kissed the ground and said the pope does this and eric moody said 
that's because he flies Air Italia. <laughs> but uh, was he, was he as cool on the phone to you when you spoke to him? Yeah, he was. He was incredibly relaxed uh, and philosophical about it. But he was great to talk to. I I had two long telephone conversations with him because I wanted to get as much technical detail about what he remembered from the flight and immediately afterwards. And and it was really really useful to my work. But he, yeah, he was charming. There was a sense of humour about what he said, and I think that's probably what helped on the day because he could keep calm. He kept everybody on the on the aircraft, his flight crew. He tried to keep them as calm as, as he could. And, and yeah, yeah, he was a great guy to talk to. Rory Clarkson from Rolls-Royce there. Well, it's time now for our question of the week. And Will Tingle has taken on this question sent in by listener Walter. What language do the profoundly deaf think in? Good question, Walter. Profound deafness is when an individual can hear nothing save for occasionally extremely loud sounds so if you do not hear sounds including those of people and yourself talking what form do your thoughts take well that depends on when the individual became profoundly deaf as deafness cognition expert at ucl bensi wall explains somebody who's become deaf late in life and who grew up only speaking english their dreams are going to be in english A person who was born deaf, the languages they might think in are going to be related to the languages they know. You can see young deaf children signing to themselves just the way young hearing children speak to themselves. So if your deafness came on in later life, it's highly likely you will retain the language you heard growing up as the one you think in. But those born deaf will see or even feel themselves signing in their head. And the most interesting research is on deaf people with schizophrenia. People who had some hearing in their lives but became deaf later, they're perfectly able to imagine just a voice. People who were born deaf do report voices, hearing voices, being in conversation, but there's always an image of a face or a person to go with it because that's their experience of spoken language that you only communicate when you can see a person. Fascinating stuff. But with this being a language, same as any other, does it develop in the same way as spoken language among those profoundly deaf at birth? Here to explain that is Burbeck University of London's Victoria Mousley. We know from research with hearing children that younger kids more so than older kids are likely to use and to benefit from overt self-talk during certain tasks, so talking their way through certain things. It seems like after about five years of age, kids do this less and it's also less useful for them. So this could be around the time where we start to see the development of covert self-talk or inner voices in young children. We also know that profoundly deaf kids who experience full native language access early in life achieve very similar cognitive and linguistic milestones to hearing children. So I would expect that deaf and hearing kids would develop inner voices at pretty similar ages and that both deaf and hearing kids' inner voices likely reflects their language and communicative experiences up until that point, but we would need more research to test these hypotheses. So there you have it. Thank you to Walter for the question, and to Bensi Wall and Victoria Mousley for the answer. Next time, we're answering this question sent in by listener David, who asks, Can an action ever truly be replicated? Excellent question, and we shall hope to have an answer for you next time. And if you know the answer or you have a question of your own, why not drop us a line? The address is chris at thenakedscientist.com or you can join in the discussion on our forum, which is at nakedscientist.com forward slash forum. There's a question of the week section of that forum where people are discussing these and other quandaries. That's all we have time for for now, though. But do be sure to tune in on Tuesday when we're going to take a closer look at the topic of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And it's a big deal. As many as one person in every 20 is affected. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith. Thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>